Jenny. Um, I'm DJ LeCrone, and I work in the office. I volunteer, and I have a part-time job uh, with Wild and Wildlife Conservancy. So thank you for joining us virtually. We're hoping to have more combinations of in-person and virtual events soon. Many of you know that Lab and Wildlife Conservancy's mission continually strives to inspire, motivate, and engage people to preserve and restore wildlife habitat. Even during these challenging times, our passion and work doesn't stop. We, may ha we have many programs that continue to need volunteers and donations that support conservation advocacy, citizen science efforts, habitat restoration, and educational outreach programs. Today's wonderful education program about snakes is presented by our amphibian monitoring lead, Jenny Swigert. Um, her whole family has a passion for wildlife conservation, as you'll see by the knowledge and enthusiasm that she shares with us today. So we're gonna be recording this program, we are now, and we'll be posting it on YouTube at a later date. So please feel free to share this with your friends in the future. And if you haven't already done so, please consider joining our mission by donating to be a member, if you haven't already, or volunteering to assist, assist with programs, especially the amphibian monitoring program that Jenny's in charge of. So we'll record chat questions for Jenny to answer at the end of the presentation also. So with that, I'll pass it on to Jenny. Hi, my name is Jenny Swigert, and um, as BJ said, that I am a, a relatively new um, amphibian monitor um, program lead um, for the Latin Wildlife Conservancy. It's a program that we were attempting to try to start this past um, early spring into now, but with everything going on, is kind of getting pushed back a little bit. Um, we'll do a little plug for that. So if anyone is actually interested in participating, in amphibian, monitor, amphibian monitoring, um, please reach out to us and let us know um, so that we can add you to the list. Um, the more people that are able to participate in that, the better. Um, a little about myself before we get started. Um, I have spent the better part of my adult life working in the zoological field. Um, I worked at National Zoo in Baltimore. I worked in Baltimore. I worked out in California with everything from elephants to big cats to bears um, to marine mammals and, of course, um, herp, herps, which are the uh, reptiles and amphibians. Um, so snakes have always been something that I have loved. Um, I have a, I grew up with an appreciation with snakes from my dad, not so much with my, my mom. Um, she actually had quite a phobia of snakes and has learned to start to appreciate them now. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is an introduction to the snakes of Loudoun County. Um, I actually actually worked for um, animal control for a number of years as well. And one of the biggest things that I would do is identify um, snakes that were local to the area. And um, there's a lot of misinformation about snakes. There's a lot of inherent reservations about snakes and a lot of misidentification. And in our area, we do have several snakes that um, look similar to the two venomous snakes that we have here. So we're gonna kind of go over an introduction of all of that, and then at the end, we can I will be happy to answer any questions that I can for you. So um, when we look at um, our snakes, and let me, move this out of the way a little bit. Um, we need to look at basically why are snakes important to us? Um, snakes are extraordinarily important because they prey upon a variety of animals, many of which we consider a nuisance, um, primarily rodents, depending on the type of snake. Um, they help keep them in balance and prevent the overpopulation. Um, and as many people know, if you have an overpopulation of rodents, that can lead to health problems for humans as well. Um, they are also preyed upon by a variety of animals, um, possums, raccoons, owls. Um, these types of animals do look at snakes as a food source. Um, and in, 
a secondary thing that they do is because rodents tend to be a big carrier of ticks, um, they also help decrease some of the tick population by preying upon these rodents to carry these ticks. So they are actually a very, very important part of our environment, um, a very, very important part of the natural food chain, and um, one that needs to be kept in, in balance. Okay, so we're going to look at, sorry, my computer's freezing up a little bit. We're going to look at some of these common snakes that we will see here in the area. Um, the most common one that a lot of people see is the eastern rat snake um, or the uh, black rat snake, as a lot of people will call it as well. This is, again, one of the most common snakes in Loudoun County. Um, and black rat snakes, eastern rat snakes, can inhabit a variety of environments. Um, anything from forest to grasslands, um, kind of near the water's edge a little bit. Um, they are actually very good swimmers and very good climbers. A lot of people tend to look down when they're looking for a snake, but sometimes you actually have to look up because you will see some snakes in the trees. And this black rat snake, eastern rat snake, is one of those that you can see often in the trees. The adults are actually a, more of a uniform black color. They tend to have a little sheen to them, but a little bit of a, a dullness as well. And that is due to what's called a keeled scale, which just means they have a slight ridge in their scale. Um, the adults and juveniles both have a head that is slightly wider than the rest of their body. The adults have a white under on the underside of the chin as you can see from that first slide that is actually a, an eastern rat snake that i took on my deck took that picture on my deck so you can see that the chin area and the underside is white on that snake um the juveniles have a patterning to them and they often can be confused with a juvenile copperhead because of that patterning that fades as they age. They are one of your best snakes for um, rodent control. That is one of their primary animals that they, that they prey upon. They also will prey upon amphibians, small birds, and eggs. And they actually use um, constriction to kill their prey. And they are an egg-laying snake. Um, so they will actually grab a hold of the, the prey and use constriction by squeezing the, the animal to kill the animal. And much like every other snake, they do swallow it whole. This is the largest snake in our area. Um, and they grow in lengths of usually about three to six feet and a little bit over six feet is not completely uncommon. And um, they can top out somewhere around seven feet and that's pretty much an extreme. But that is the largest snake that we have in our region. So one that gets confused oftentimes with the eastern rat snake is the northern black racer. The northern black racer looks very, very similar to the eastern rat snake, except it has kind of a black to bluish black coloration, and it's very, very uniform as an adult. Um, their head is about the size of the width of their body. So whereas the eastern rat snake, the head is a little bit wider, this one is very, very uniform in width all the way from the, the nose all the way down. Um, they grow about three to five feet in length. They can be found in your open grasslands to lightly forested areas. They are patterned as a juvenile, as you can see as well. And one thing that you can look at with the difference between the eastern rat snake and the black racer as an adult is the eastern rat snake has a very defi defined pupil, whereas if you look at the eye of this black racer, the entire eye looks more uniformly brown as well. They do not have the keeled scales as the eastern rat snake does, so it gives them a glossier, shinier appearance when you're looking at them. They um, are also one that consists of rodents for their primary for diet. Um, they will also eat frogs, lizards, and occasionally other snakes. They do not constrict like a 
an eastern rat snake does, but rather they actually will pin its prey down and they swallow it alive. And this again is one that is actually very, very easily confused with your eastern rat snake. So that's another wonderful snake to have around for your rodent control. So this is one that's probably gonna be very, very familiar to everybody. Um, this is a eastern garter snake. This is actually one I took on the path, and this is an eastern garter snake who was not too pleased with me taking his picture. Um, as you can see, it's kind of puffed up a little bit and flattened out. And you can even see the head almost takes on a triangular shape, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, that's one of the things that people have learned from usually a rather young age that the snakes around here have a triangular shaped head. And that is typically true. However, some of these non-venomous snakes can also have that shape of a head when they feel like they are being threatened. Um, they reach lengths of about 18 to 26 inches. Their scales are slightly longer and keeled which means that they have that ridge in the middle of them. So it gives them not as sleek and shiny of an appearance, but a little bit of a um, textured appearance. They inhabit pretty much every environment from water's edges to fields, to forests, suburban gardens and urban areas. Um, with the advent of um, all of the development occurring in Loudoun County, you will start to see some of these snakes more in occupied areas because with occupied areas come these animals that they prey upon. Um, and these, these uh, garter snakes actually don't tend to eat rodents. They are a smaller snake, so they tend to eat worms, millipedes, spiders, insects, some of your smaller amphibians, and even small fish. They actually can be quite feisty when they're handled. Um, and um, they can, just like the eastern rat snake, they can actually shake their tail um, against the leaves or the underbrush or any leaf litter to kind of warn off any threat, any perceived threat that is coming to them. They give birth to live young, and they're often confused with a common ribbon snake. And you can see with a garter snake, one of the big things when you want to tell the difference between a garter, garter snake and a ribbon snake is on the side of the head, they actually have black markings that go down the side of their face. And on the next slide, you'll see the common ribbon snake. They do not possess those black markings. They are, the common rib, ribbon snake is a type of garter snake um, in the same family as the Eastern garter snake, but they do not have those lines on the side of their face, and they are actually a very, a much sleeker snake over the, uh, the garter snake. The common ribbon snake um, has a thinner body and often a narrower head. They are about a foot and a half to about two and a half feet in length. And you'll find them more at the lower elevations than in the mountainous areas and they often prefer more aquatic type habitats and grassy areas. So water's edges, fields, those kinds of things, but they're less frequent up in the mountainous areas. They do feed on um, amphibians and small fish for their primary diet, and both the common ribbon snake and the garter snake are live, give birth to live young. And that's actually a very important thing, which is why I'm putting it in here, is if somebody finds a clutch, which is a group of snake eggs, then you can actually kind of figure out what type of snake it is or isn't. Um, you'll know that it's not a ribbon snake or a garter snake because it does not lay eggs. It gives birth to live young. So both of those give birth to live young. So this one right here is our Eastern milk snake. Eastern milk snake are fairly common in this area. They have markings, and we're gonna actually go over markings and differences um, later on as well. But they have these blotched markings that go down their back that almost to me look like these loose edge squares that are folded over their back. 
and they tend to have these little blotches, almost checker patterning of a blotch and then a lower and an upper and a lower and an upper and a lower. They also have a marking you can see right here on the top one that is similar and it depends on, on the snake. It's, it's similar to the letter Y or V or U. And they can come in a variety of different colors. You can see this one has a little more red and these ones have a little bit more brown. And but the thing that will always be distinctive is that marking on the back of the head. It is going to either be the shape of a Y, a U, or a V. Um, they are about two to three feet in length, and they prefer forest edge, hope and habitat areas, and um, human habitat. They are another one of your mice eaters, your rodent eaters. They also have been known to eat some smaller snakes and lizards. They, um, funny enough, they actually got their name milk snake because you see them a lot in the field. And old time farmers would talk about how they would go up and milk the snakes, so or milk the cows. So it was really a weird kind of way that they got their name, but that's how they are actually called a, a milk snake. They do lay eggs and they are actually frequently, frequently confused with the copperhead. So this is your northern water snake. Your northern water snake is a heavier snake. Um, it grows about three to four and a half feet in length. And they prefer areas, as their name would indicate, of slow moving waters such as lakes, ponds. They, um, they are, tend to be very, very dull at the adult stage in their coloration. So if you look at this snake right here, it kind of has a dull overall appearance. The juveniles have the same markings, but are brighter in color. They um, give birth to live young, and they are also another one who is confused with the copperhead. The poor copperhead is getting a little bit of a hard time with the snakes in our region. Um, and they will too flatten their bodies and expand um, when they are agitated or threatened. And that too can give them an appearance of having a, a triangular head and that flattened body as well. Um, these guys primarily eat fish and amphibians, and you won't you won't typically see them any place where there isn't water nearby. Um, so that's kind of what makes the difference with these northern water snakes that we have in our area. This one is one of my little favorites and it cracks me up because this snake is really, really small. And those are my hands with very thick gloves on holding this, this tiny little northern ring neck snake. I was not holding the glove, having the gloves on because of the snake, but rather I was uh, battling a huge batch of plants in my side garden um, and happened upon this little ring neck snake. So the little ring neck snake is very, very distinctive in, in its appearance. It has the band that goes just behind the head around the back of the neck. They are a very little snake. They grow maybe a foot to a foot and a half at the most. Um, and they are a very thin snake. If you are looking at one that is not full grown, you can actually mistake it for a large worm sometimes. Um, but they tend to be very, very secretive. They tend to like to burrow um, into the leaf litter under loose, under loose dirt. Um, so it's something that you could see potentially in your garden area. They like the leaf litters, rotten logs. Um, so a variety of those substrates that have a little bit of moisture to them. And um, you, will, you, can, you will rarely see these guys unless you are out gardening um, and they happen to be in your garden because they tend to be very nocturnal in nature and very secretive in nature. They do lay eggs and their diet consists mainly of your slugs, snails, and some of your smaller amphibians. So for those people who don't like to have the slugs and snails in the garden, it's actually a really good thing to have those, those northern ring snakes in there. Um, they are completely harmless and they are relatively fast moving snakes. If you uncover one, they are gonna try to um, to recover themselves again. This snake right here is your 
is your big snake eater of the bunch. Um, this is the Eastern King snake. They um, tend to range in length from about four feet to five feet. They are less common at the higher elevations. I live up here um, at the base of Short Hill Mountain, and um, this I have yet to see an Eastern King snake here. So they like the lower elevations. They tend to live in their forests fields, along streams, and in urban areas. And their diet consists of other snakes, including copperheads and your timber rattlesnakes as well. Um, but they also eat lizards, amphibians, and rodents. And they too use constriction to kill their prey. So this snake right here is going to be the one that is gonna be in, mo just like most of your king snakes, typically tend to be primarily snake eating snakes. And they also are an egg laying snake as well. And I have yet to see one yet here on the mountain at the base of the mountain. So I'm hoping to be able to find one soon. This little guy is called a decayed brown snake. Uh, decayed brown snake, um, they're a small slender snake. And they are between about 10 to 20 inches in length. So they're actually a, a rather small snake. You see them a lot more frequently in urban areas, um, primarily under rocks, in the ground, underground, in logs. Um, they are also another one that tends to eat your uh, slug snails and grubs. And they are very beneficial in controlling the population of those, those critters that you don't really necessarily want in your garden areas. The young ones are, um, these ones are often confused for the young juvenile copperhead, um, but the patterning on the decays are more of a spotted patterning. And um, as you'll see later, the juvenile copperhead um, has a yellow tip tail when it's, when it's younger. Um, and they do give birth to live young. This is by far my favorite thing. <laughs> um, and it's one that a lot of people won't see or haven't seen, but um, they are in the area. And this is the Eastern hognose snake. The Eastern hognose snake is, is like I said, one of my favorites for a variety of reasons. Um, they have a wide range of coloration and difference in a pattern. As you can see on these two pictures, this hognose snake is almost completely uniformly black. If you look very carefully, you'll be able to see a little bit of patterning, whereas the one above has these stripes that go down the back and these spots that come along the sides of either side of the snake. So one of the best ways to be able to identify the snake, and I have a picture coming up, is by the snake's head. And the snake is called an Eastern hognose snake because the snout of the snake actually turns up. So it creates almost like a hognose-like look to it. It ranges at about a foot and a half, two feet to just shy of three feet. They live in forested areas with sandier soils, fields, and in your coastal areas. They tend to be more active during the day. And I'll caveat that because most of your snakes um, during this time of the year are not going to be out so much during the heat of the day. So they are going to be in the early mornings to the early evenings. So a lot of the activity level of the snakes that you see around here are also going to be determined by the temperature as well. Because we have to remember snakes are called, are what are called ectotherms and they basically need to use the heat in the cool to help regulate their body temperature. So they cannot handle excessively hot snakes, uh, excessively hot temperatures. So during the heat of the day, that's when you're gonna find them kind of hunkered down until the weather starts to cool off a little bit during the day. Um, they do lay eggs and they can also be confused for a copperhead and sometimes confused for a timber rattlesnake as well. Um, one of the reasons that they are one of my favorites is they do two things that um, other snakes in our area do not do. First of all, they are able to flatten the skin around their neck and raise up similar to what a cobra can do, but not as dramatic as 
what your COBRAs are able to do. And the other thing is if that does not work, they are able to feign death. So that is an actually a living Eastern hognose snake that has resorted to its next method of self-defense, which is feigning death. So they will roll over, actually open up their mouth. Their tongue will often hang out of the side of their mouth, and they will emit kind of a foul-smelling musk, which is a very much a deterrent for a lot of, a lot of animals that would try to eat them. So if, if flattening out doesn't work, if raising up similar to that of a cobra doesn't work, at last resort, you're going to try and feign death and make yourself look as undesirable as possible. So that is the head of an eastern hognose. So you can see here where the snout actually turns up. And it get, does give a little bit of that hognose-like appearance from the front. And that is actually the best way to be able to identify these snakes because the patterning is very similar in these snakes. I mean, the patterning doesn't change. The coloration changes quite a bit. Um, and as you saw before, you, you can actually have the snakes that are almost completely black in color. So that head for these guys is a very important identifier for these, for these snakes. So now we're gonna move on to the snakes that everybody kind of worries about in our area. And um, oftentimes we'll misidentify for the ones we have looked at. Um, and that is our first one is the Eastern Copperhead. The eastern copperhead is more of a slightly heavier bodied snake, and they average actually in length of about three feet. They are distinguished. They tend to have a copper color head and a reddish tan. It can be sometimes a darker tan or a lighter tan, depending on the snake, for overall for their body. And they have these darker hourglass shaped bands that go down the body. They consist for their diet mainly of mice and occasionally some birds, and they also tend to be preyed upon by your owls, your hawks, possums, and sometimes your other snakes as well. They reside in a variety of habitats, including woodlands along streams, rocky, rocky hills, fields, um, and these guys will actually den to hibernate in the winter with other species of snakes oftentimes. So they tend to, to do what's called a communal hibernation den, and that can include other copperheads. It can include Eastern um, rat snakes. It can also include black racers. So they can also actually all den communally over the winter. Um, the females of this particular snake, um, they develop, the young develop via fertilized eggs, then the fertilized eggs actually develop inside the female, and then the uh, young copperheads are born live. So this little guy here, I actually, we, this is actually our shining moment. We did a herpetology count for the Virginia Herpetology Society two weeks ago. And this guy right here was our, I think our final snake sighting of the day. And um, it was just about maybe two feet away. We were actually looking at a box turtle at the time and turned around and I looked down and there it was on the edge of our, our taller grass. And um, the thing about these, these guys is they actually are very, very secretive snakes. They do not um, tend to actively go and seek anything out. Rather, they will sit and wait um, for something to come in close proximity for them um, as far as prey is concerned. They are our most common venomous snake. However, they are our least venomous snake. So when you compare them with a timber rattlesnake, which are the only two venomous snakes we have up in this area, um, the copperhead's venom, even though they are both what's called a hemotoxin, which um, actually breaks down your, the red blood cells to help with digestion, the, um, the venom of the uh, Eastern copperhead is far, far less um, less toxic than the, that of the timber rattlesnake. They have probably one of the best camouflage of any of our snakes in this area. 
which is why it can be so hard to see them. And if somebody is going to get bit by a venomous snake in our area, it would generally be the copperhead. Um, most of the bites occur if somebody is stepping um, very near to them or on them or actually inadvertently grabs them or puts their hand on them. If you are gardening, um, those are the areas where you can reach down and not even see it. If you're hiking and you go to sit on a pile of rocks, you may have that copperhead in a, in a rock next to you. Um, or if you're hiking, you could step too close to it or actually step on it. And those are the instances where your bites tend to occur with a, with a copperhead. Um, as you saw with the Northern Ring Snake, uh, ring neck snake picture. Um, I tend to wear thick, thicker gloves when I'm doing any kind of yard work or gardening. Um, just because the thinner garden gloves, if you don't have a good visual of what it is that you are doing, um, they are not thick enough if you were to actually get a bite from a copperhead or any of the other snakes. Any of the other snakes we talked about can bite. Um, the copperhead is just one of two that actually um, can secrete a venom into you. Um, and also wearing boots when you're walking in, in copperhead ter territory, wearing some kind of foot protection. Um, we always used to call the copperhead the ankle biters and the rattlesnakes the knee biters. Um, so you just want to make sure that, you know, you, you kind of are not overly cautious, but aware of your surroundings um, so that you protect yourself. Because the copperhead, if you're looking right at it, oftentimes you don't even see it because they're camouflaged meshes in so well with the surrounding um, that it is very, very difficult to see. Um, if anyone is bitten by a copperhead, they need to seek a medical attention immediately. The, um, the complications are not as severe as that of a rattlesnake, a timber rattlesnake. However, they can cause some complications. Um, with any of the venomous snakes, um, any of the snakes really, unless you know how to handle them, um, you don't want to, to mess with them and pick them up because that's just antagonizing and, and threatening that snake. Um, you don't want to try and pick it up. You don't want to try and mess with it. You just want to leave it alone and, and back away from the snake. So the next one that we're going to look at is our timber rattlesnake. Timber rattlesnakes are in this area. Um, they are not as common as your copperhead. They are a large-bodied snake as well. They're kind of a heavier body, and they reach lengths of about three to five feet in length. They tend to be in Loudoun County, more towards the western parts of the county, where you have more uh, mountainous slopes and rocky terrain, rather than in the east of the county, um, where it tends to be a little bit more flat. Um, they tend to be recognizable by their darker markings, which look like bands that go around the snake and you can see you can have lighter phases you can have darker phases but with both phases they both have those bands that go around the snake um and they kind of almost look slightly chevron like in shape and of course the biggest thing that identifies a rattlesnake is that rattle um which you often will not hear until you're you're pretty close to it so that's the best way to identify those the rattlesnake from a distance is by those darker bands that are almost chevron like even if the snake itself is darker between the bands you can still see those bands stand out most of the time um they tend to eat primarily rodents mice chipmunks squirrels they are um very good ambush hunter. They tend to uh, sit and wait for something to pass by them um, and approach them rather than actively going out and hunting for them. They give birth to live young and they do hibernate in the winter, either solitary or in communal dens, much like some of the other snakes. There are areas where um, timber rattlesnakes actually can be slightly more communal where you can have a den area of several rattlesnakes, and then there are areas where rattlesnakes tend to be more solitary. So the thing about the um, timber rattlesnake that's different from the copperhead is the venom is 
a lot stronger in the timber rattlesnake and is considered a highly venomous snake and a bite should be considered a medical emergency. If someone were to get bitten by a, a uh, timber rattlesnake, they would need immediately an immediate medical attention. Um, their striking distance is more than that of a copperhead. Um, so they can actually strike about a third to half of the length of their body. So happening upon a timber rattlesnake, um, you want to give them the girth that they need so that you're not within that potential area zone of what they can strike. And I actually really like this picture because you can see on these scales um, what the keeled scales look like that we've been talking about as well for several of these snakes. So if you look in this black band right here, you see kind of a white little notch that goes down the center here. That's actually the keel or the ridge part of the, the scale. So the scale has a little bit of a lifted ridge towards the middle of each of those. So when we talk about a keeled scale, that's what we're talking about. And you can see that this snake does not have a smooth streamlined appearance because of those keeled scales. It looks a little bit more textured. In some snakes, some snakes like this timber rattlesnake, the keels are a little bit more defined and a little bit more raised, so it gives it even a, a bigger appearance of texture than some of the other snakes. Um, bites from a timber rattlesnake are actually very, very rare. Um, contrary to what people will think about the timber rattlesnake, they actually tend to be rather docile. They're considered one of the more docile of the uh, rattlesnake, and they're very, very secretive. Um, they are able to give a rattle as a warning. Um, anything that is perceived threat to them, including humans, which will keep them away from the rattlesnake. Um, and that's not always the case. If you happen upon one that's a little bit closer and you kind of surprise it, that would actually be an instance where you would not hear that rattle. But for the most part, you're going to hear some form of rattle if you get close to, to what they what their area is and if they perceive you as a threat. That rattle is actually comprised of segments made of keratin like the fingerna our fingernails. Um, when they perceive that threat, they raise the tail and shake it, and that's what, what makes that rattling sound. Um, and again, do not attempt to um, handle this rattle a rattlesnake. Leave it alone and back away. Most of the time, you don't even know these snakes are here until you're out in an area where you just happen to come upon them. Um, and due to our kind of inherent fear of the timber rattlesnakes and the habitat um, fragmentation, their population in certain areas are actually starting to decline. And um, certain areas, um, the timber rattlesnake is actually called the canebrake rattlesnake. And um, oftentimes during more of the, uh, towards more of the coastal areas, um, they're called the canebrake rattlesnake, and those populations have actually started to decline too. And they are one of our snakes that do eat rodents, and they are actually a very, very important snake as well. Okay. So when we talk about the venomous snakes that we have in the area, the venomous snakes are called pit vipers. Both our eastern copperhead and our timber rattlesnake are pit vipers. And pit vipers have some very, very distinctive features that some of the other um, venomous snakes do not have in other parts of the country or parts of the world. <laughs> and pit vipers basically just mean that these snakes have a pit and you can see them between the eye and the nostril of both the copperhead and the timber rattlesnake. And that pit is actually um, sensed infrared radiation. So they can determine how close and how large something is by the amount of infrared radiation or heat that that animal is giving off. And that is one of the things that they use in order to be able to determine if an animal is prey, and if so, how close or how far away is it. So they use that as information to help with finding their prey and keeping potential threats away from them. <clears throat> Excuse me. They also have a triangular-shaped head, as we talked about earlier. Those triangular-shaped heads 
are due to modified muscles around their venom glands. Those are very specialized muscles that actually squeeze the venom glands and actually um, allow the venom to go into their prey or perceived threat. Um, so that's what causes that, um, that triangular shaped head. Some of our other snakes around the area, like you saw with that um, Eastern garter snake and with the um, Eastern rat snake, also have the ability when they are threatened and they puff up or flatten out, it can also create a head that looks very, very triangular in shape. And that's where a lot of people can get confused as well with the difference between some of these snakes. So when I, when I go over kind of these things with the pit vipers, um, I'll show you a little bit, just a slightly bit later as to maybe what a better method of trying to identify these different snakes are. Um, the pupils on, um, are elliptical in shape rather than round. So you can see they're not a round pupil. Um, your non-venomous snakes in the area have um, round pupils, although some of the snakes, like your black racer, it's very, very difficult to see that pupil because of the fact that the whole eye is slightly more uniformly brown. Um, I don't recommend somebody trying to walk up to a copperhead or a rattlesnake to really get a, a good view of what their pupils look like. Um, because if you can see the pupil of their eye, oftentimes you're a little bit too close. So, but that is something that, that is very, very specific to our pit vipers in this area. Um, and again, both the copperhead and the timber rattlesnake possess what's called a hematoxic venom. The hematoxic venom actually helps break down tissues and red blood cells to aid in digestion. And the timber rattlesnake um, venom is more, more potent than that of a copperhead. So we're gonna look at some of our commonly misidentified snakes in the area. And we're gonna spend more time on this part as well. Um, because this is, I think, one of the more important things that people need to know when they're looking at any kind of snake that's in the area is what makes a copperhead a copperhead and what makes an eastern milk snake an eastern milk snake. Um, my time in animal control, I would very frequently identify snakes for people either via email or they would bring them in. And unfortunately, I would say 90% of the time when they brought them in, they were bringing me in a snake that they had killed. Um, for me to identify what it was. And most of the time, it ended up being either a milk snake or it ended up being a juvenile eastern rat snake. So for me, really getting to know what these markings look like is the most important thing for identifying these snakes. Because you can see this picture of this copperhead. You can see these markings that they have. But you can't really see that pupil of the eye very well. So what I like people to look at is the markings themselves on these snakes. And the Eastern Copperhead is very, very distinguishable by the fact that it has these dark hourglass bands that go around the body of the snake. So it's gonna be often thinner at the back line here and then widen out on the side on both the inner and the outer side of the snake if you're looking at this coiled snake right here. Um, the bands are always gonna be darker. These hourglass bands around the snake are always gonna be darker. This intermittent area here can be a variety of colors. It can be anywhere from almost a light tan to yellow all the way to a slightly darker brown, but you will still be able to see these bands right here as well. If you look over at our Eastern milk snake, you can see they do have these blotches and you can see how people can, can oftentimes confuse these two snakes. Um, but these blotches, like I said, are almost, almost for anybody who lives in the, in the Lovettsville area, almost squircle like So they're not quite a square, square and not quite a circle. They're kind of squircle like a little blotch. And they kind of lay over the back and they end about midway down the back. You can see on the side here, they end about midway down on both sides of the snake. 
And then they're going to have these smaller patches, these smaller spots that are kind of on the underside. So looking at this snake, whereas the copperhead, wider part of the banding is actually towards the bottom side of the snake or the ventral side of the snake, and it's narrower towards the top, these milk snakes actually uniformly have these blotches that go down the down the back and they're not attached and do not continue down all the way to the to the belly of the snake. Um, so that's one snake that is very, very commonly confused with the uh, eastern copperhead is the um, is the milk snake. Another one that is very commonly confused is the uh, northern water snake. The northern water snake, and they can inhabit similar areas. Um, northern water snake, as we talked about before, tend to be primarily an aquatic snake, um, either in slow-moving lakes and, and rivers and ponds or on the edge of those areas. Copperheads can be found as well on those edges of those areas, um, but there are some distinct differences between these two snakes. So as we said before, and I'll keep repeating it so that it becomes one of those things where if you see a copperhead, you'll be like, oh my gosh, I really now see it, is you have those hourglass bands, and it's narrower at the top, and it widens out. That's why they call it an hourglass. And I was actually raised as a, where it was a butterfly design, where it was a butterfly marking is, is kind of how I learned it, where the center would be where, where the body is and the wings kind of come out towards the, the periphery right here. Um, whereas if you look at the northern water snake, they have more of a banding that comes around and you can see it's almost a split band right here. So they have these blotches that go along the top and then these striped markings that are on the lower half of the sides of the body as well. On, on these snakes. So you can see you've got the stripes, the stripes, and you've got almost a band, almost a band going along in here as well. When the northern water snake is an adult, they tend to be, again, kind of a duller color. The younger ones tend to be brighter in color. The markings are the same, but the, but the coloration is a lot brighter. So um, a lot of times you get your juvenile water snakes being confused with your eastern copperheads as well. So here is your juvenile copperhead and your juvenile rat snake. And, and these two are actually frequently confused. Um, one thing that the juveniles have is a yellow tip on their tail, that that actually fades as they age. So, that's one very, very distinct, and it's a bright neon yellow green color. So that's one way to really distinguish those juvenile copperheads. You can see the copperhead marking is still the same. So you've got the where it's thinner in the center, and then as it goes down the sides at the back, it gets wider, um, making that hourglass shape. And here you can see it's wider, goes narrow, and widens out again. And here your juvenile eastern rat snake has blotches and blotches along the side as well. Um, a lot of times you'll see a band, like a dark band right here on the Eastern Juvenile, uh, juvenile Eastern Rat Snake um, that obviously this uh, juvenile copperhead does not possess. But you can also see what I was talking about with the pupils. This Eastern Rat Snake, you can just see a very, <clears throat> excuse me, clearly defined round pupil. Um, and that actually stays the same even through adulthood. Whereas even some of your non-venomous snakes like the black racer, that pupil is harder to see because the entire eye has, has more of a brown coloration to it. There's your juvenile black racer. And there's your juvenile copperhead as well. Again, these two are confused because I think a lot of times people see pattern and they think immediately copperhead. They don't think about the other things that, that these snakes potentially could be. And because a lot of people tend to be leery of snakes or actually afraid of snakes, 
um, the first thing they think about is how do I get the snake away from me? Um, and unfortunately, oftentimes that can result in somebody killing, killing one of these snakes. Um, but you can see this one has the different blotchings that go down the middle, has almost like a reddish brown blotching on a grayish body. Um, and you can see that pupil is pretty pronounced here, but as they age, that pupil actually becomes um, more meshed with the rest of the color of the eye. So here is your eastern copperhead and your eastern hognose snake. So again, you can see on here the banding starts narrow and comes down on your copperhead. And here you've got a series of blotches around the back and then a series of spots that go down the side and these spots actually get smaller as it heads towards the ventral or the belly side of the snake. And this is one of the snakes that people oftentimes will um, confuse with the timber rattlesnake as well. So the timber rattlesnake, again, has these bands that go all the way down and they make almost a chevron type of appearance to them, where if you look at the eastern hognose snake, um, you're going to get these blotches that go down the back that are almost rectangular type blotches and you're going to have these circles and they get smaller and smaller and smaller as it goes towards the belly of the snake. So that's pretty much one of the only snakes in our area that people will um, misidentify as a timber rattlesnake. For the most part, people will misidentify the um, copperhead rather than the timber rattlesnake. So let me go back again for a hot second here. So we have our butterfly hourglass banding on the sides of this on the side of the snake that goes all the way from one side and over the back, where we do not have that banding here. Basically. A good rule of thumb is your non-venomous snakes tend to have blotched patterns along the back and blotched patterns along the side, whereas the markings of your copperhead are more uniform. You don't see every once in a while, you'll see a few little blotches here and there, but that marking right there that goes from here all the way to the other side tends to be more uniform and tends to continue on where you can see this one has the blotching down the back and this one has the blotching and more down here and on the side. Again, you can see that hourglass marking. And here again, you'll see the blotching that goes along and then you'll see that hourglass shape for this copperhead. Hourglass shape, blotching hourglass shape and you can see a few little blotches right in here but they're very very light it's that distinctive hourglass banding that you're going to be looking at and you can see the blotching rather than this continuous marking that goes from one side to the other same thing here the, the timber rattlesnake the bands go all the way from one side to the other one side to the other one side to the other and here you have the blotching appearance as well for the for the copperheads or for the timber rattlesnake. So in Virginia, um, and this is kind of a very important point to hit, not just for snakes, but for, for any of our wildlife. Um, first of all, in Virginia, it is actually illegal to kill a snake unless it poses an immediate threat to a person or a livestock. Um, Virginia actually takes its livestock regulations very, very seriously. Um, so if it's posing any kind of a threat to your livestock or to your person, and they do consider um, if a snake is inside of your house as a potential immediate threat um, to, to a person. Um, otherwise, it is actually illegal to kill a snake in Virginia. Um, another big thing for um, snakes and all wildlife in Virginia is it is illegal to trap and relocate wildlife in Virginia. 
Um, you're allowed to trap a snake that is in close proximity to your house, is in your garden, any place like that. Um, and you can relocate it, but you need to relocate it still on your property. Um, if you release any wildlife, including snakes, to any other location, um, it can introduce diseases that other populations are not, um, have not been exposed to, and it can cause an imbalance in the population. Um, so some of these animals actually don't have a very big area in which they live, and moving them to another area can actually be quite catastrophic on that environment that you are both taking the animal from and bringing it to. One of the, um, the big ones that I, I like to look at is actually a box turtle. Um, people will find box turtles and pick them up and take them home or see them on the road and say, oh, I need to move you to a safer location. Um, and that box turtle may only live 250 yards, 500 yards from where it was hatched. And moving that box turtle to another location can actually introduce diseases um, that other populations haven't been exposed to. I actually um, did some volunteer work for uh, rehabilitation and they had very, very strict regulations as to how you dealt with uh, box turtles when you were cleaning any box turtle um, enclosure for ones that were being rehabilitated. And you basically had to sanitize everything, including your, yourself, before you moved on to clean and, and handle and treat that next box turtle that came through. Um, so it's very, very important to, to kind of know what those laws, laws are. And the laws for relocation of wildlife doesn't just pertain to um, snakes, but it pertains to all wildlife. Um, you're not allowed to trap wildlife and relocate it in another area. Um, even if you work, when I worked for animal control, you, we were, it was very specific how far we could relocate if somebody had a, a raccoon in their attic. There was a very specific amount of, of, of distance away from that location that we could release it. Um, and even people who are licensed to remove wildlife from your home um, or from your area, they too are not allowed to um, release wildlife into another area because that same issue with disease transmission and an imbalance of the, the natural population can be affected. Um, so that's why it's, it's very important to make sure that you know these snakes, know that snakes' jobs aren't to try and scare everybody, aren't to try to um, to go after anybody and certainly aren't to try to harm anybody. It's all about perceived threat. And we may perceive that snake as a threat. However, if you look at the flip side, they're perceiving us as probably a greater threat to, to them as well. So a lot of times people will ask, how do they deter snakes? Um, snakes are attracted to areas that provide them with a source of food and areas where they can uh, stay hidden. Um, you're not gonna frequently, unless they're basking, unless they're trying to warm up, um, you're not gonna see them out in the open actively around. They are also prey animals and as such, they try to stay as invisible as possible. Snakes tend to be very, very secretive animals, which is why you don't see as many snakes around as you probably have in your area. Um, and that says a lot for actually the overall demeanor of the snake. Um, there are things that you can buy um, to help deter snakes, but it's, it's really a waste of money. Um, mothballs and the snake deterrents that you can buy at the farm stores, um, they don't really work. Um, a lot of it is kind of the, the old wives' tale, um, but they don't really work like people would hope that they do. Um, snake traps and glue traps are, are effective, but they can be extremely inhumane. Um, snake traps often are comprised of a netting and the snake gets caught in it and it can actually cut into them and do a lot more damage. Um, and the glue traps as well, they get stuck to them. And basically in both of these situations, 
um, the animal can start starve to death if left alone for a long period of time because it can go very long periods without eating. Um, however, people will, and I have seen it working animal control, they will put a snake glue trap in their attic and then two years later go up and see these snakes that, that died on these glue traps um, that they forgot they even put up there. So those are those are actually extremely inhumane methods of trying to manage snakes around your property. Um, there is snake fencing, which actually can be rather effective, but it can be costly. Um, people, when they use snake fencing, oftentimes will use it around their garden. Um, because if you've got, you know, rodents getting into your garden at all, then the snakes will, of course, come and follow them looking for prey. Um, but you have to have one of the big things with snake fencing is you have to actually comb that area very well to make sure that you're not enclosing a snake into that snake fencing. Um, the best way to keep snakes away from your residence is not to provide them with an ideal habitat. And I had to, I had to actually go out and, and be the good doobie the other day and, and weed eat in front of my, my house because it was looking rather, rather overgrown. Um, they, so the best way to do it is to keep those areas trimmed. You don't want to have the tall vegetation around your house. Um, they, that's actually a great hiding place for snakes to be. Um, if you've got a lot of landscaping rocks, landscaping pavers, um, any of those things, snakes can and will hide around and under them. So you want to keep any debris from those cleared up. Um, any debris overall in your yard, um, like you know, we're we're repotting some of the some of the plants that we have, and we have you know um, potting some potting soil, and we have some um, uh, bigger bigger pots, and those are wonderful areas for a snake to like to be. Um, so any of those things around your house that don't need to be there, just just move it out of the out of that area because the more hiding spaces you give a snake the more often they will take advantage of those hiding places because it becomes a safe place for them to live. It becomes a safe place for them to search for their prey. Um, remember too, that it will help keep rodents away from your residence as well. Um, because rodents are also attracted to the debris and any tall vegetation that actually makes a great place for them to be able to hide makes a great place for them to be able to build nests as well. So when you're trimming and keeping areas clean for um, for a snake, you also can be helping it for keeping your rodent population down as well. Um, any types of bird feeders, um, bird feeders are a huge one for attracting wildlife that we may or may not wanna have right in our backyard. Um, but any of the spillage from the, from the bird feeders will attract rodents, and those rodents will attract the snakes. So if you have bird feeders out in your yard, um, you want to make sure that you keep that area underneath those bird feeders cleaned as well. So any of those things that can attract, if you've got bird feed in, um, in trash cans, make sure you have them in metal trash cans um, rather than plastic trash cans. Um, you want to make sure that any of those areas are um, are free of that debris and are rodent proof because if they are rodent proof, you're going to have less likelihood of there being snakes coming up to your house. Um, if you find a snake in your house, it can oftentimes tend to indicate that there might be a rodent problem that you were completely unaware of. Um, this often happens very frequently in basements and in attics where people don't often go as frequently. Um, so the presence of a snake in your unfinished basement may actually indicate the presence of a rodent problem in, in your house that you need to maybe investigate further. Um, and if you find a snake in your house, you want to do an inspection and make sure that there aren't any cracks in the foundation or that any cracks around the windows, anything like that that's not sealed, um, because snakes, snakes will get in, in and out through those areas. So if you have those in your basement um, as well, you want to make sure that, that the areas that need to be sealed and tended to are sealed and tended to. 
and coexisting with our snakes. Coexisting with our snakes. Um, like I said, I kind of I grew up with with a dad. I grew up actually with a dad who loved snakes, and a mom who was absolutely terrified of snakes. Um, my mom had an uncle who was actually bitten by a um, western diamondback when she was younger, um, and that kind of gave her a long standing. And it wasn't this area, obviously, but it gave her a long standing fear of snakes. Over time, she learned actually to appreciate snakes. She still wouldn't say that she loves them, but she has actually a growing appreciation for the snakes. My dad loved snakes. Um, he found them absolutely fascinating in everything that they did. Um, and we would actually actively, actively go out and, and search for them. Um, they are a huge, huge vital part of our ecosystem. They keep every, help keep everything in balance. They are not a top predator nor are they the bottom prey. They are right in the middle. Um, they prey upon animals and are preyed upon by a variety of animals, which is extremely important in the process of keeping everything in balance. Um, we are gonna see, and probably people probably have reported seeing more and more snake encounters because of the fact that there's a lot of encroachment on what used to be their habitat. Um, so you're going to see, because they're, they don't have as much room, you're going to be sharing space more and more, which is why I wanted to go over a lot of the um, differences between the snakes so that we would know and people would know how to identify snakes. Even if it's a copperhead, I mean, we found that copperhead the other day and we have no idea where it is. We know it's out there somewhere and we know there's probably more of them, but it didn't do anything to us. It didn't harm us in any way. Um, it was actually still very, very secretive and stayed absolutely still, which is what they will do um, when they perceive a threat. They tend to stay very, very still. Um, they don't seek out to bite people. They don't seek out to chase people. They, they have very, very simple needs in life. And those are the only things that they need to fulfill in, 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 their, in their world. They need to regulate their body temperature. Without regulating their body temperature, nothing else happens. Um, they need to eat and they need to reproduce. That is basically everything that a snake needs. Um, and they are very, very good at perceiving threats and they're very, very good at giving warnings to these threats that they're, that they're perceiving. Um, we just need to be able to look at the snake and see what it's showing us and what behavior is exhibiting and know that if it's a non-venomous snake and it's flattening out or puffing up and even some of your snakes can make a hissing sound um that we are a threat to that snake and that that snake is actually doing us a very very good favor as well by keeping the rodent population down i mean we we live in a in a cabin that has a 230 year old portion attached to it at the foothills of Short Hill Mountain out here. And, and we don't have any rodents in our house, but we do have some snakes around our house. Um, so I would rather actually have the snakes around my house than the rodents in my house. Um, most of your snake bites are actually from people trying to handle them. People not understanding the warning signs that they're giving and encroaching more and more on that area. Um, some of your snakes are easier to handle than others. Some of your snakes are a little feistier to handle than others, which means they're not going to be as, as easygoing. Um, a lot of time your eastern black rat snakes tend to be very, very docile snakes for the most part. Um, your black rat racers can be docile, but not as much. Your garter snakes can be feisty little guys, whereas the ribbon snakes can maybe be a little bit less feisty. Um, so each of these types of snakes have different personalities as well. Um, but most people, most people get bitten by these snakes when they are um, attempting to handle them. Um, and some people may never like snakes, but one can appreciate them, hopefully, for the benefits they provide. They are very, very opposite of what we tend to find cute. Um, when, uh, when I worked at one of the zoos that I worked at, um, they actually were doing a, a study on why 
trying to figure out why people were fearful of some animals and less fearful of, of, of other animals. And they had, um, they actually timed the amount of time that people would stay at each exhibit. And the reptile house, which was absolutely wonderful, um, the average length of stay, and it was actually quite a fantastic thing watching people track these guys. Um, the average length of stay was approximately two to five minutes through the entire reptile house, um, which is a very, very small amount of time when you're considering how many different different reptiles and amphibians there were to see. Um, so they, they noticed that these areas that had animals such as snakes or spiders, insects, any of those tended to have less visit, visitation time. And then they started to look at it and basically people identify most with animals that look most like that of a human baby. So big eyes, pudgy cheeks, all of those wonderful features. Um, that's why everybody likes the giant panda so much. Um, giant pandas actually are not as nice as people think they are, but they look so cute because they have the big black eye patches around their eyes and they just look um, very, very cute that people are drawn to them. But the, le the further you get away from those attributes, the less people actually like them. And the less people try to learn and understand about them. Um, and fear can often come from, from not trying to learn and understand from them. So that's one of the big things is to, to get to know the snakes in your area. We're hoping that this kind of gave people an idea as to the differences between the more, the common snakes that you're going to see in this area and how to, how to effectively identify them and learn more about them so that we can all live more happily together is kind of my goal for this. So with that, um, we're gonna open it up. If anybody has any questions at all, um, we'll be more than happy to answer any, any questions that anyone might have. Hi, Jenny, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I understood that one of the uh, characteristics of the black snake, or whatever it's called now, is also the shape of the body is somewhat unusual. It's not kind of round. It's a little bit squared off. Is that right? Yeah. So the, the, the eastern black rat snake, yeah. And, and that's actually a, a fairly recent change to that name within the last few years. It used to, we used to just call them black rat snakes. But yeah, the, the eastern rat snake. Um, yeah, their body, the, the racer tends to have more rounded um, body, whereas your black rat snake can often have um, more slightly of, a, of an edged body or a triangular body shape um, for that snake, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And so, yeah. I'm just wondering, I've only ever seen a rat snake and a garter snake on my property, but judging from what you've been talking about, I've probably got quite a lot of other things out there too, since I've got woodland and stream and a bit of swamp. Oh um, yeah, ab absolutely. So, I, so I'm going to be a lot more careful when I'm out <laughs> in the woods. And, <laughs> I mean, I yeah, like to- Yeah, and that's- Yeah. And that's what I do is, you know, is, and I'm not afraid of snakes. I'm not worried about them, but I do respect them. Um, I do respect that, you know, I'm coming into an area that they perceive as, as an area they need to protect for themselves. And as such, if I'm going through, I mean, I just, I just pulled a, a ton of, of non-native plants yesterday. Um, yes. And I had no visual to the ground at all. And so I made sure I had my boots on, I made sure I had my thicker gloves on because I had no visual as to what I was actually putting my hands down into. But but yeah, you've got, with those different variety of, um, of habitats you have on the property, you could have quite the range of the snakes that we had talked about today. Okay. Yeah. I hope, I hope I see them, but like like you, I'm going to be much more careful where I put my hands when I'm pulling in basics in future. Yeah, yeah. And and if you've got an area, you know, if 
like my areas are not perfectly manicured garden areas. Um, but if you have an area that you can see the ground, you can see very well your your field of vision is is good. Um, then a lighter glove can be fine. You know, if I go out and I see dang Japanese silk grass um, growing, I'll just go ahead and pull it out. Um, but yeah, when you when you have um, less invisibility, it um, for me and all I have are like the the slightly thicker, the thicker work gloves that you can get at like Home Depot or Lowe's or any of those places um, that you can still actually really use your hands, but they tend to give a little bit more protection. Right. Um, yeah. Also, what I do is when I go hiking, we have actually hiking poles. Um, and if you're walking through any tall grass or any place um, where you don't visually see in front of you, you can use that hiking pole to kind of push that tall grass out of your way. Right. I, I am not, <laughs> I'm usually one of those that is the, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Um, but as I get older, I'm, I'm more like, that's a foolish, foolish concept in life because people will often look to somebody and see what they're doing as an example. Um, I actually had an incident where we were walking um, outside of Lost Mountain in Shenzhou National Park. And I tend to, to like to walk in areas with no shoes on. And so I was walking on this well-established portion of the um, going towards down. Um, it's a connector path to the Appalachian Trail. And it was just a nice path. And so I'm like, you know what? It's a nice day. I'm just going to take my shoes off. Walked down to where it connects up to the um, Appalachian Trail and came back up. And I walked. And then there was a couple behind me, maybe about, what, 10 or 15 feet behind, yelling at me going, did you just see that rattlesnake? It came out like six feet behind you. And I was barefoot. So <laughs> I'm sure I got yelled at by my dad. I was like, you know what? I better just uh, be more of a better example and um, and not maybe go walking on the around the trail barefoot. So yeah. Um, but using a hiking pole is a really nice way because you can actually gently brush things aside if you're going to be walking in areas that you can't have a good visual on as well um, to be able to just push it aside to give you a better better visual. Hey, Jenny. Yeah. If you um, think you have a snake problem, do you know who you would call for help? Um, it, you know what? That's actually a tricky question. It really depends on the situation. Um, most of the time, animal control won't come out for a snake if it's like in your garden area or anything. Um, however, Sometimes, depending depending on the day, they will come out if it is inside your your physical residence, um, because animal control doesn't typically deal as much with wildlife as they do with domestic. But their responsibility for wildlife is if it's posing more of an immediate threat, and if it's posing more of an immediate threat, by definition, is um, being in your living space. So, if you are seeing a snake in your living residence, um, that would be one of the first I would call um, to um, to let them know where it is um, and see if somebody can come out and and help help take it out. I've removed I've actually removed copperheads from people's curtain rods and and such inside of a house before when I work for animal control. So so they will come and if it's if it is a like I said a, a more of immediate threat and inside of your residence is generally defined as an immediate, more of an immediate threat. Um, so they would be the first people I would call. I would also, if you call any um, pest control wildlife removal companies, um, I have had experiences where some of them will tell you that, yes, they are gonna humanely remove it and relocate it, but they don't tell you that they can't legally relocate it. And what they're gonna do is euthanize it and that's their euphemism for it's kind of like when you were a child if your dog passed away it went to the farm um that's kind of their euphemism for we're going to relocate it it's you know it's going to be euthanized so so you want to do your research before you pay somebody to come in um because a lot of times and even with the person with the copperhead on their curtain rod they just wanted it out of their house so i removed it and lo relocated on their property um, far enough away from their house that 
it would be more um, unlikely for it to become a, a recurrent problem. Good to know. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm loading. I think I have a question here too. Oh, I think that that would be uh, that would be the one with the uh, snake problem. And actually, I this topic came up the other day. It's slightly different. Um, however, it is one of those myths about snakes. I love being a snake mythbuster. Um, that the venom of a juvenile copperhead is that it's more potent than that of an adult. And I actually had heard that. I had actually learned that. Um, and that actually, you know, from, from a young age, and that's actually not true. Um, the venom of a copperhead is the venom of a copperhead. Um, what makes the difference between the two is that um, the adults have several things going for them. First of all is experience. It actually takes time for their bodies to produce venom. And as such, they are not going to basically waste venom on a perceived threat. Um, so if I were to walk very close to a copperhead, um, there is a higher chance that I will get what is called a dry bite, which is where they bite you but they actually don't inject any venom into you. Um, or they can inject very little venom into you because they need to have those reserves of that venom stocked up for actual prey items. Juveniles don't have that control and experience yet. So they can often be um, a little quicker to bite sometimes. Um, but they don't inject as much venom as well. Um, there are, they're still doing studies on venom, and I think they always will, um, that some studies have shown that potentially in certain snakes, maybe even like the timber rattlesnake, that the enzymes in the adult venom can be actually more active than in the juvenile. So that's one thing that I hear a lot is that, um, is that the juveniles, the, the juvenile copperheads, um, can be more venomous than the adults um, and therefore more dangerous than the adults. The, the younger ones can be quicker to strike because they have a lot more at stake. They're smaller, um, so they are more susceptible to a larger variety of, of predators. And um, they, uh, they don't have the experience that an adult snake has. Um, to be able to determine, hey, I need to kind of, I need to kind of put this in reserve. Um, so I wanted to kind of dispel that as well. Um, that no, the the copperhead, the baby copperheads are not more venomous than the adults. Um, a lot of what you see is behavior, um, as experience, and um, and most of the time, a lot of the time when you get bit by an adult copperhead, and the same can actually go for rattlesnakes as well um, to a certain degree, but you can, uh, you can often get what's called a dry bite. Anytime you get bitten by a venomous snake, you need to, you need to go and, and seek medical attention immediately and they'll monitor and they can actually determine by monitoring whether or not any venom was injected. If you get bit by a non-venomous snake, um, you still need to take care with, with that wound because you don't want any infection to set in. Um, given the nature that anything that eats other animals can have a higher rate of uh, bacteria in their mouths. So you want to be able to take care and make sure you clean those wounds really well um, and make sure that you properly tend to those as well. Do you have any other questions? Any cool snake stories? Anyone who has decided that they love snakes now? <laughs> Hello. 
Oh, you've decided you like snakes, BJ. Did you decide, BJ, that you like snakes now? I will never, ever hurt another snake again, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Is that admitting of past harm to snakes? In the past, yes. In the past, before, yes. Before Loud and Wildlife Conservancy and becoming a Virginia nat master naturalist, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great example of, of the whole point is the more we learn, the more we can respect things and not harm them unnecessarily. Absolutely. Right. Everything has, has their place in our environment. And, and my husband's actually from South Florida where he had pygmy rattlesnakes and um, coral snakes. And so for him, you know, me saying, hey, let's go see if we find a copperhead, um, you know, you look at past experience and now he's talking about getting snake gators so that when we're walking through the thick brush to look for these guys that you know our our lower legs and, and feet are staying safer so it absolutely is about education and understanding the important role these animals play in in, in the environment mm. yeah because i am way too lax out there cleaning in my yard where there's higher debris or you know plants so i have to respect their habitat and and dress accordingly <laughs> yeah yeah and and we live i said our property right now we live on a on a slope um that's very very rocky and um has boulders big old boulders for retaining walls because we are at the base of short hill mountain um, and it starts to slope up pretty quickly here. And um, so we have boulders that are retaining walls to keep everything from, from coming down on us. Um, and there's so many places for, for a snake to hide. Um, and that happens to be areas where I have my, um, my dang tree of heavens deciding that they want to grow through as well. So, so I, I have to kind of go crawling through these rock works to try to, to cut down these and, and take care of this tree of heaven that's growing. Um, but it makes you a little bit more aware. Um, and if we don't learn about it, we often tend to stay afraid of it. We tend to stay fearful of them. And when I look at this picture of this copperhead, I see this, it's just a, to me a beautiful, beautiful animal. I mean, mm -hmm. the markings are fantastic. It, the colors are beautiful. And their ability to camouflage as well as, as they do is just to me a testament as how wonderful nature is and how wonderful wild, wildlife is. Um, so that's what I see when I see this this copperhead. Right. Well, once again, thank you very much from from me. That was brilliant. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? Come. We will make sure that we post this after we figure out how to do that. Right, Dory? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Jenny. And now I feel like I can identify snakes a little bit better. <laughs> they all kind of look alike to me. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. And, and you know, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to reach out to, to us. You know, we want to, for me personally, I, I want to be able to be a resource for people who have these questions. I mean, I would, I would much rather help somebody identify a picture of a snake than have somebody kill a snake through misidentification or concern about that snake that's in, that's, in their garden or in their woods or anything like that. Um, but yeah, once you start to get to know and get to look at these animals, um, you, you can start to tell the differences in their appearance as well. Once again, we need more amphibian lovers to join with JK Black Oak being available for research. It'll be a lot of fun for anybody that wants to join in. Absolutely. and. This, this past year, sadly, with the coronavirus has been, has been a challenging one for everybody. And um, that includes a lot of the programs that, that we've tried to do with on wildlife. And um, so um, the, amphibian, the amphibian is actually very exciting because it hasn't been done for, for several years. Um, and we are kind of revamping uh, portions of the program to keep up with the current um, national um, tracking for these amphibians. Um, just like snakes, amphibians are hugely important. I'll plug in the amphibians now. 
um, are hugely important um, to our ecosystems. They, because of the way amphibians are structured, is they tend to be one of the first indicators of environmental problems. Um, they have skin that absorbs the moisture around them and can inherently just absorb the uh, any toxins that are around them as well. Um, so keeping a monitor of the population of amphibians is actually vital to looking at the health of your environment. Um, so the um, so what the amphibian monitoring program will do is it doesn't matter what the location is. The, yeah, the JK Black Oaks will be absolutely fantastic, and we hope to be able to do some amphibian programs up there as well. Um, but it can be your backyard pond. It can be your neighbor's backyard pond, with permission, I'll caveat that. Um, we actually found vernal pools at the bottom of our property, which is very, very exciting to me. Um, so any place where amphibians are likely to breed, um is where we want to focus and that will start taking place um actively monitoring in the mid february range when your spring peepers start to come out um and we will actually be scheduling trainings for people so that they will be able to be familiar with what they're seeing what they're hearing um to be able to participate in it the the newer system, which actually takes all of the old data from, gosh, 20, 30 years of data that used to be from the um, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, um, which they're no longer doing that program, but all that data is still included, but the, pro but the program is now more streamlined and more user-friendly so that it takes less, less of your time driving to you know, a half an hour to find a location um, and then having, so it takes up, you can actually cover more areas if you choose to, or you can choose if you have a backyard pond, that can be your monitoring area. So there's a lot more flexibility because like I said, it doesn't matter if it's the backyard pond or the vernal pools that we discovered at the bottom of our property, each of those locations are important indicators for how that those environments are doing. So yes. Yeah, so we would love if anyone is interested um, to reach out to us for um, for the amphibian monitoring program, which will be uh, coming up for, like I said, early February. That sounds like a long way away, but it really is not. Um, and the trainings that we'll be setting up for them as well, so that everybody is is well versed and fully trained as um, as that time time approaches. Great. I'll certainly be signing up for that. I'd, I'd love to be able to know what's on my property. Well, Wonderful. I mean, things I accidentally come across. So. Yes, yes. And for anybody who likes amphibians, they're actually doing some really interesting studies with biofluorescence, and they're discovering that actually amphibians um, have a biofluorescence to them. So under a specific um, UV light, um, they can be viewed and they actually glow. So there's actually some recent research as of like, even just as early back as this past February, I think it's maybe the University of Minnesota, um, I'm not sure, or Wisconsin, um, that they're actually looking at it through a um, filtered lens and um, at certain, certain light, blue light, um, UV light spectrums, um, they're actually seeing biofluorescence in amphibians. Which actually, I thought I thought it was actually pretty darn cool. Yeah, that's that's outrageous. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> they're not bioluminescing. They're not producing their light, but they are fluorescing with this. Yeah. And it's and it's fantastic. So you can see like these these greens and yellows from these pictures that they've taken. It's actually quite quite phenomenal. Does hey, anyone Lori, have any other questions? I'm Lori sorry? was asking if uh, they can, I guess, participate if they're from Fairfax County? I think um, so. I, actually, yes. And, and, and this is why I say yes, is that um, the program, which is now, it, again, is a national program, is based from um, chapters. 
So they have the charter members, the chapter members. And I actually took the the test and all the training and everything to become um, one of those for Loud and Wildlife to become the chapter lead. Um, so Loud and Wildlife is just like two shakes away from officially being a chapter for this national program. And there aren't very many of these chapters locally. So regardless of, you know, if they're over in the Fairfax line, um, as long as we know what the location is, we can actually add it to those counts because there aren't, there isn't another um, chapter uh, close. I think we're one of the only ones in the Northern Virginia area. I think there might be one other. So yeah, I mean, as long as we know where the distinct location is, that's going to be the important part for reporting. But we can report it through Loud and Wildlife Conservancy, um, just as long as because we're the, we're we're going to be the one of the charter chapters. Um, we just need to know what that location of that of that area is. So yes. Okay. Any other questions? All right, mm -hmm. Thanks, Jenny. Looking forward well, to another session. I say I hope you enjoyed it. It um, this is my first ever uh, Zoom type of um, I guess online type of um, of presentation. So it was a little bit it was a little bit interesting, but it was actually quite fun. I actually I do long for the days when everybody can do it in person. Mm -hmm. um, which will be nice. So hopefully everybody stays safe and and we can all get through all of this together and come out on the other end and go tour the JK Black Oak property and a lot of other ones for some wonderful amphibians, birds, butterflies, and everything else. And our snakes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.